Thank you. So, um, yeah, wonderful to be here. Thank you for, for um, inviting me. And uh, I hear it's final exams this week. So uh, if anyone does have exams, honored that you're, you've chosen to be here and listen to me rather than revising. I'll try and make it more fun than revising this talk. Um, so I am Michael, and uh, I am sometimes known as Mr. Moshi to anyone under 12, which I don't think there is anyone in this room. Um, I'm also known as Acton on Oh, hang on. Yes, there we go. So, um, also known as, uh, yeah, Mr. Moshi, acting on Twitter if you want to heckle me at any point or say nice things. Uh, and this is my Mr. Moshi get up, where really just an excuse to wear face paint and drive around in the Moshi mobile, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, today I, I thought I'd tell you the story, the story of my entrepreneurial adventures over the last uh, many years the ups and the downs and the roundabouts. Uh, many, many mistakes and screw-ups have been made and uh, hopefully going to be able to share a few of the, the stories, the painful lessons uh, along the way. So it started many, many moons ago. This was my first business. Uh, I sold rocks, um, which uh, have a really high margin because you find them in the back garden, but uh, zero revenue. Not a single person bought my rocks. <laughs> So this is the first lesson. Don't uh, sell rocks um, unless you can add some extra value around them. Uh, so that was quite a humbling experience, um, but I didn't give up. Fast forward many, many years, and there were lots of, um, lots of intermediate businesses as I, was, as I was growing up, washing cars and uh, selling apples to the neighbors and digging up the back garden to create koi carp farms, which my parents loved. But um, it wasn't really till I went to, to university that I uh, got back into entrepreneurship, and I was fascinated by these um, gadgets, <laughs> and toy, boys' toys, games, um, all sorts of fun stuff, remote control cars and uh, digital cameras, um, and felt there was a really interesting opportunity to build a, a new type of uh, business um, in this area. This is about 1998, so quite a quite a way ago. Firebox, this company that I set up, just had its 17th birthday, which is a, a bit weird for a tech company. But this is what we thought life was going to be like. Me and Tom, um, students, uh, dancing on giant pianos, uh, living the life of big testing and playing with all these exciting new products. And I think this is another really important lesson. Whatever you go into, whatever business you build or work on, make sure it's something that you absolutely love and are excited about. Because if you are setting up your own thing, you're going to spend most of your waking hours and, and many of your dreaming hours thinking about it as well. So that was the start. That was the, the early uh, stages of Firebox. We had our crazy idea. Uh, I moved to Cardiff to live in Tom's. Tom Boardman was my business partner. Um, his parents said we could use their attic as our office. And so we got free rent, which was very exciting. But we didn't have any money. We went to see the local banks in Cardiff to see if they'd put cash in, and, and no one would. Uh, we didn't have any rich friends to invest. So it was quite, quite stressful. And, uh, Entrepreneurs have to be pretty resourceful. So we saw an advert one day in the local uh, Cardiff papers looking for people to sell their bodies to medical science. And uh, we, uh, we volunteered. We were very excited. We went to a little place in Merthyr Tydfil, which is this, um, in the middle of Wales. And uh, we got paid £400 to be injected with a new anti-migraine drug uh, for a week. And uh, it was a great deal. We, um, we emerged alive. And my mum was so impressed that we, we did this and raised our kind of, uh, got very gritty raising our startup capital that she put £1,000 in as well. So we had enough money to buy uh, a spare computer. We got a printer. And, and we were properly underway. And as I say, this was 98. So we didn't really know how we were going to sell our products. We thought a shop would have been way too expensive, um, a mail order catalog, again, just out of our depth. And the internet was just getting going then in the late 90s. It was still seen as a slightly strange thing. A lot of people thought it was a fad, but we thought there was something really exciting there. So we cobbled together a, a website and um, launched it to the world as Hotbox. And as you can see with this beautifully designed logo we put together, uh, the products were so hot, they were literally bursting out of the box. Um, and this was great. We loved it. We registered hotbox.co.uk. But there was an American company that owned hotbox.com, which we didn't think would be a problem. But it was, because it was actually one of the world's largest porn sites back at the time. <laughs> hotbox, who knew? We were very, uh, very naive. Uh, 
um, chaps, and uh, it wasn't too embarrassing until my mum would go around telling all her friends to check out her son's incredible new company, Hotbox, and some, some of them ended up on the wrong page, and she was disinvited from coffee mornings in Buckinghamshire for a little while, but uh, luckily they can see the funny side now. So we changed the name uh, from Hotbox to Firebox, and it was a little tricky in the early days. We didn't really have any money for marketing. Hardly anyone was on the internet then. It was great because there weren't many customer, there weren't many um, competitors, but there weren't many customers um, either. So again, Tom and I had to get resourceful and scratched our brains and uh, um, came up with a, a crazy new idea. I, this is my old school photo. I used to be in the chess club, which uh, that group is, and we invented um, a new game called Shot Glass Chess. Uh, we thought we could make chess more exciting by adding alcohol. And I think if you add alcohol to most things, it makes them a little more exciting, uh, sometimes dangerous. But we, um, when Tom's mum went out one day, we raided her crystal drinks cabinet and uh, we filled up a load of glasses with vodka and, and Tom was the uh, southern comfort. And the idea is every time you um, capture a piece, you have to drink it. So the better you're doing in the game of chess, the more drunk you're getting. So it's the, uh, the perfect leveler. Um, good handicap system. This was Tom after a queen sacrifice. <laughs> if anyone's met Tom, he doesn't normally look like that, so he, he just had to down three, three shots. And we thought this was such a fun, ridiculous idea that we, um, we thought we'd make it. And uh, we went about figuring out how to buy and put 32 uh, glasses in a box with polystyrene wrapper and a um, instruction and everything else and it was a bit challenging and a bit tricky but we managed to do it and we then sent our press releases to um, everyone we could think of and we learned a really valuable lesson here as well the power of story you know if you have a human interest angle to whatever you're doing the press are going to be really intrigued so these two slightly naive uh, weird chaps living in an attic in Cardiff invent this ridiculous new game and uh, we got in FHM and Loaded and Maxim and we were on BBC Radio Wales. We even made it to page three of The Sun. Not the, not the main picture, thankfully, but a, a tiny little comment on the bottom. And orders started flooding into our website and it was super, super exciting. So we were underway, we had our first product, uh, we we're making revenue. And the first six months had been quite tricky because no one knew about us. Our turnover was about 20 pounds a month. One of our friends would order um, every now and then using fake names to try and G us along. Uh, but now we had proper revenue. Uh, I think we did about 20, 20 grand um, that Christmas. And so we were super excited and, and on the journey. And this is uh, what a proper shot glass chess set eventually looked like. I think we had to take it off a few years later because there were so many knockoffs. But anyway, it got us going. Uh, it was the spark to Firebox, and Firebox is still going now, great for Christmas presents if you're looking for something slightly unusual. And I still love it. But my other passion is games, and I, I don't know if anyone had one of these um, or knows what it is. This is uh, a few, <laughs> few hands, people of a certain age, no offense, sir. But, uh, <laughs> um, this was the very powerful ZX Spectrum, 48K of memory. Uh, which uh, is not a lot, but the developers conjured up all these incredible games. And my dad bought it for me, so I do my homework and, and uh, write thank you letters to people. But of course, all I wanted to do was play games. And it, it sparked my imagination, this little black box. And I thought, when I grow up, I want to uh, have a games company. So I stepped aside from, from Firebox um, full time and set up Mind Candy. So this was around, uh, this was about 10 years ago, as the internet was really starting to, to develop and, and uh, come together. And I thought, what if you could mix games and the internet and not just a few people playing games together, but hundreds, thousands, even, even millions. So the first game we created was uh, a treasure hunt. And it was based on a book I'd read years ago called Masquerade. Don't know if anyone knows this book. Um, it's a little obscure, but this very eccentric English chap called Kit Williams buried a golden hair somewhere in the UK countryside. And, uh, and then he wrote a book with clues leading to its location. So loads of people bought the book uh, and uh, set up treasure hunting clubs. And um, he even went on, on Wogan to talk about it, which was the most viral thing you could do back in the late 70s. And uh, the whole country went wild. And eventually, a few years later, it was found. But it, it sowed a seed in my head. And years later, I created what I thought would be its kind of um, uh, natural successor, Perplex City, 
uh, a world of puzzles, mystery, and intrigue. We buried uh, a treasure, um, and we offered a £100,000 reward for the first person that could solve all the clues and piece things together and uh, find this treasure. And uh, got a lot of press, got a lot of um, awards. We. Uh, we created a, a world, uh, all these characters, dozens of fake websites. We created a music album, and if you listen to some of the tracks backwards, they would reveal certain clues. Uh, some of the puzzle cards that we sold, if you held up to light, a password would appear. And another one, if you squeeze lemon juice on it, might give you geo coordinates for a location where if you dug it up, you'd find something, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. It's the most creative thing I've ever worked on, the most commercially disastrous, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, it was just too complicated. You know, we created something for ourselves. We totally geeked out on it, and uh, we didn't pay attention to what the market um, actually wanted. And as I say, people were fascinated, but not enough people took part. So with a very heavy heart, we had to put this on a hold. We'd raised about $10 million from some very serious venture capitalists to create this. So this was a hugely stressful time when I had to go to the board and say, it's not working, we're going to kill it. We've got a little bit of cash left, one final roll of the dice. And I was sitting in a, a coffee shop in um, South London, uh, doodling away, as I, I love to do. And I drew um, a little uh, sort of monster stroke penguin <laughs> and thought, wouldn't it be fun to, to bring this to life, to create a website where kids or anyone could adopt their own little monster and, and look after it? And um, that was the, the kind of first spark that Moshi grew into. And it was inspired by something called Pet Rock. <laughs> so this, I think, is a genius idea. This chap in New York called Gary Dahl put a rock. In, in fact, he managed to make money from rocks. <laughs> I, should have, I should have paid more attention. But he put a rock in a box, wrapped some straw around it, gave you a little instruction manual, packaged it in the beautiful box, and became a multimillionaire. I thought, good on him. <laughs> um, so. Sometimes the simplest ideas can be the best. So as I say, I sold rocks with nothing added. He added a little bit of value and uh, found the magic. So Moshi was sort of like the digital version of the pet rock or uh, the next stage beyond Tamagotchi. And we brought on board some amazing artists and animators and engineers and, and designers and started to, to build it. And again, you adopt a, a monster. Uh, you look after it. Um, and it was very slow in the early days. We launched it in about 2008, and nothing much happened for the first year and a half. But because it was a digital business, we could tweak and iterate and test. And finally, we eventually found the magic in the summer of 2009, when it just took off like a rocket. And uh, we were adding one new sign up every single second, over 2 million every month, just growing like a, a rocket. Got to um, tens and tens of millions of registered users all around the world. And uh, that was. Um, that was a, a really exciting time. So for those that haven't played Moshi, kids adopt a monster. They fill in the adoption papers. It lives in a room. And the thing we're very proud of is the puzzle palace, where you do puzzles with your monster. And I love the idea of making uh, learning fun. I think it's a huge, huge opportunity. We're seeing massive growth in ed tech at the moment. But I still think there's uh, massive potential there. I think the, the education industry globally is about $4 trillion. Um, so making uh, games fun to help uh, the zillions of kids out there that uh, love games but don't necessarily like learning. Um, massive potential. So this was the, the really important part of Moshi. Kids would come back every day. They'd learn flags of the world and uh, maths and spelling and English. They'd earn rocks the better they did, which was the currency, which they could spend on Main Street. Uh, they could go to the grocery store and buy some food or horrids if they had lots of money, or yakia for their furniture. Uh, we like our puns. And there's just tons to do in, in Moshi, a huge, creative, crazy world. Hundreds of different characters for kids to collect and, and learn about. Um, a massive world for storytelling and adventure. And uh, these are some of the characters. Again, we liked puns. Music was very popular as well. Um, but what we are, uh, oops. What? Yeah, music was really, really popular. So um, we had all sorts of characters from Broccoli Spears to uh, Banana Montana, uh, 49 Pence. One of my favorites was a little character called Lady Goo Goo. She was incredibly popular. The kids absolutely loved her. But um, an actress of a similar name, or not an actress, but a, uh, a pop star, took great offense at, at Lady Goo Goo. And we got uh, an injunction from her lawyers um, telling us we had to remove her. And I thought it was a, a joke, but my lawyer said I had to take it very seriously, otherwise I could end up in jail. So I did take it very seriously, and uh, can't talk too much more about that. But <laughs> <laughs>
moving swiftly on. Um, so this, this was one of the first sketches for Moshi. I wanted to build much more than a website. I wanted to create um, a, a, a brand. And the way we thought about the brand of Moshi was there would be a digital heart. Um, and that was the, the website. And that was a subscription business model. But beyond that, if we could create something that kids loved uh, enough and they could connect with the characters and stories. Maybe we could create books and magazines and cartoons and trading cards, and it would all interconnect together. And uh, that was the, the, the plan, which was a little crazy. But um, because the core was so strong, uh, that came true. And we built, I think, a, a fantastic on and offline brand. So um, with the number one best-selling kids magazine, it outsold The Economist and Vogue and FHM. Three million books were sold, 100 million collectible toys, number one DS game. It was just amazing. Um, and we tried not to over-commercialize it. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but some of our fans just loved it so much, and they wanted to collect all the different elements. And I, uh, this, uh, I love this picture, because um, yeah, this is one of our fans. When I was little, I was the same for Star Wars. Wanted every single element and just loved every aspect of, of the brand. So Moshi has been um, an incredible. Uh, journey, but also quite an interesting lesson as well. And I thought it would continue growing and growing forever. And for any of you that get into the, the kids space, there's a, a really important learning here. Um, you can grow and create hits in the kids entertainment space relatively quickly, but they can also come down just as fast as well. Kids are like flocks of starling. They can move in one direction, then almost overnight move elsewhere. And Moshi no longer became flavor of the month a few years ago, and our revenues and our profits uh, evaporated. And so it's been quite a stressful couple of years trying to figure out how we can breathe life into this brand, what new platforms we could take it on. Um, and uh, it's been very tough, but our vision uh, remains the same. We want to create the greatest entertainment company in the world for this new digital generation. So we've been cooking up and dreaming lots of new weird and wonderful ideas. Um, and uh, uh, those are some live, some in development in, in various stages. But again, the learning from this is that you know, being an entrepreneur or being in a startup is, is not all plain sailing. It's a roller coaster. There's huge, huge euphoric highs, but also crushing, devastating lows, sometimes both within the, the same day. And you have to be very strong and very resilient to, to cope with all that. It's definitely not for the, for the lighthearted. Um, I think you need to also be slightly, slightly unhinged to, uh, to launch a, a startup, um, because by any rational measure, um, what you're doing just doesn't make sense. Pouring your heart and soul into something, most people will tell you you're mad, uh, often not just for months, but sometimes for years and years, and the vast majority of startups fail, um, which again, so the odds are, are massively stacked against you. So, um, uh, but it's also hugely fun and, uh, and exciting. So. Um, I, as I say, built Mind Candy. I'm still uh, running Mind Candy, and I, I love it. And we're working on a lot of new things. But I've also, as I said, it's also been very stressful the last couple of years. And a little while ago, I was getting to the point where I was waking up most mornings more tired than I was when I went to bed. And I just seemed to have a headache most days, and uh, just was exhausted all the time. And um, I realized something wasn't quite right. And the joy of work had faded to a kind of dull ache. And uh, I'm not the, the only one, I think, that sometimes feels this. Um, we live in this amazing age where we all have supercomputers in our pocket. But these kind of images are the, are the stories of our, the images of our time, people walking around almost on autopilot, completely consumed um, in their phone and the world there, rather than other people and, and things around them. And it got me thinking um, and led me to my next business, uh, Calm, which I'm super, super excited about. So um, uh, basically, there's been, as I say, there's something going on in the world at the moment which um, I think needs people to, to think about. There's, uh, the World Health Organization has said that the uh, stress is the epidemic of the uh, 21st century. They're estimating about $300 billion a year is going to be lost to business because of stress-related issues. It's the root of so many problems. 70% of visits to the doctor are traced back to stress-related issues. It leads to everything from high blood pressure to um, bad sleep to back pains and so on. And uh, massive, massive issue. And 
antidepressants have become an easy way of kind of dealing with stress and depression and anxiety and a whole range of other issues. Um, in the UK, the uh, antidepressant subscriptions have uh, doubled in the last 10 years. Um, so this is uh, a, massive, a massive issue. Um, there's a word in Japanese that describes um, death from overwork, which is, I believe, Kurochi, which again suggests something uh, very wrong is going on out there. We're all so busy. People, when you ask them how they are, people are afraid of saying, not busy. Busy is kind of this, this epidemic. And I love this quote, all of man's difficulties are, are caused by his inability to sit quietly in, in a room by himself. And just been thinking about this a lot over the last few years. There was actually a study done in uh, Harvard last year that caused a, a lot of surprise, where um, they put uh, people individually in a room and asked them to just sit on their own for 15 minutes. But they also gave them the chance to give themselves a, a quite painful electric shock. And <laughs> And you'd think no one would, uh, would take a shock over just uh, sitting quietly on their own. But 75% of men chose to um, give themselves a painful electric shock to, to uh, who knows exactly why, but to, because they couldn't cope with being on their own. <laughs> um, only 25% of women did, so <laughs> they're, they're obviously far more, more sensible. Um, but again, this suggests that uh, something strange is, is going on um, out there. And Standards of living have been rising um, uh, dramatically over the last uh, few decades, but our general happiness levels have not. And as I say, I think it's time to, to maybe pause and to stop and have a, a think about this. And, and this is what led me to calm. Um, so this is one of my, my favorite uh, quotes. You know, all these things I, I'm talking about are, are up here. The problem and the solution is in our minds. The mind is its own place and can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. It's the lens through which we look at everything. What I find is, is fascinating is it's our most precious and valuable resource, yet how many people bother to learn about it? How many people are, are teaching others about it? The mind doesn't come with an instruction manual. I think it's amazing that we don't teach our kids more about this in school or, or even grown-ups as well. And um, I think this is one of the, the root reasons why we're living, it seems to be, in this age of anxiety and there's so many uh, mental health-related issues. So, as I said, I started a few years ago, I started thinking about this more seriously. and. Um, I did something uh, when I was just feeling exhausted with work. I did something I'd never done before, which was to book myself on a solo holiday. And, um, you know, I don't know about you guys, but uh, it seems very few people go away on their own. Bill Gates does it twice a year. He goes off for his, or he used to go off for his reading weeks, and he said they were some of his most um, valuable and enjoyable times. So I, I went away um, to the, uh, the Austrian Alps, and sat uh, in, uh, went for walks, um, frolicked in mountain streams, uh, did a lot of thinking, played a lot of tennis, but also had time to think, to, to properly get away from all the stresses and strains of, of work, didn't look at my email. And uh, I love reading, and I took a lot of books with me. And as I say, I was fascinated by um, neuroscience and mindfulness, and this idea of kept coming back to mindfulness and meditation and, and trying to figure out if there was something there. So read lots. Um, search inside yourself is fascinating. This is how Google introduced a, a mindfulness program that has been enormously popular um, over the last few years amongst their 50 odd thousand uh, employees that they offer it to. 10% uh, Happier is a great book, a New York Times bestseller. Don't know if anyone's read it, but uh, I highly recommend it if you haven't. This chap, Dan Harris, was a newsreader in the US, and one day he had a breakdown live on air, and uh, he went to see his doctor, and his doctor said, you know, your lifestyle is ridiculous, you're out every night, uh, you're not looking after yourself, you're eating badly, um, I could put you on a course of um, antidepressants and, and give you some pills, but have you ever considered meditation? And he said, you know, piss off, <laughs> or um, something stronger than that, don't be so ridiculous. Um, but he eventually gave it a go and tried it. And the book is his story of how he went from complete cynic to absolute convert of mindfulness and meditation and how powerful um, it is. So many other interesting books I, I read there as well. And as I started looking into this, I'd never have thought 
myself would um, be intrigued about this and interested in meditation. I think it's got a really bad, uh, sort of a bad reputation almost. It, it, the words it conjures up for most people are perhaps um, woo-woo and fluffy <laughs> fluffiness. And I think there's religious over overtones. And uh, you know, I thought, would I have to wear orange robes and sort of um, cover myself in patchouli oil and all these other kind of images that kind of get conjured up. But as I looked into it more, I realized what fascinated me more was the, the neuroscience, the science behind it, what on earth was going on, why this has been so popular for thousands of years and why the West seems to be waking up to it now. And this, I think, is a really interesting chart showing the number of peer-reviewed uh, research papers on mindfulness over the last few decades, a complete academic backwater for, for a long time, and then in the last 15 years or so becoming a, an incredibly hot subject, so much so that um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of papers are, are being written and uh, many more each, each year. So, as I say, this, this fascinated me and uh, I wanted to, to learn more about it. And I also got the chance to, when I was away, to practice it for myself and see what it was like. And I sat, and for anyone that's tried it, it's, it's not easy. Meditation is, is really tricky. You sit and suddenly your head just fills, washes with all these thoughts and ideas and you dredge up stuff that you hadn't thought about for ages and think about everything from the washing to conversation you had with your primary school teacher decades ago. And it's tough. And I thought it was all about just sitting and chilling out for 10 or 20 minutes, but there's actually much more to it. What it essentially is in, in, in quite it's sort of simple terms is you're training the attention muscle of the brain. When you sit and, and meditate, or the, you're focusing on a, a constant, so your breath, for instance, and every time a thought pops into your head, you acknowledge it and you gently move it away and return to focusing on the breath. And as I say, it's difficult, but the more you do it, the more you practice, just like going to the gym, strengthening your muscles, uh, the stronger your attention muscle becomes in your brain. And that's incredibly valuable for everyday life and uh, has, a, has a huge, huge impact. Um, one of the, the, the benefits is that it allows you to respond to situations in everyday life rather than reacting, which most of us do. We become more of a master of our own mind rather than a slave to it. We don't get yanked around by our emotions so easily. And again, learning about the mind and how it works, you know, this incredible dance of hormones and uh, electrical impulses um, that goes on up here, I think is, is super valuable time spent uh, trying to understand it. So as I say, I became fascinated and uh, started to realize many of the benefits myself feeling less stressed, sleeping better, um, having a uh, sharper focus and, and so on, increasing immune systems. And many of these studies have, have looked into uh, some of these benefits. Um, it's not a complete silver bullet, obviously, but it's a, a pretty powerful use of uh, you know, 10 or 20 minutes of, of your time every morning um, to improve the, the rest of your day. So as I say, I became so fascinated, um, as I, I usually do when I get into something, I want to build a, a business around it and share it uh, with the world. And with a friend of mine, Alex Chu, um, uh, we, uh, we used to um, live together with another friend of ours in London. And uh, we had the chance a few years ago to buy the domain name calm.com, which I thought was such a, an epic domain name. And uh, it's one of my favorite words. So we thought, what if we could build a, an amazing brand around the concept of calm? And we thought we'd start by creating a, um, an app that uh, would teach people how to meditate through um, guided meditations. It's a really easy way to start. So Headspace have been doing this for a few years very successfully, and some of you may be aware um, of them, and they're doing extraordinarily well. Um, and uh, we wanted to um, yeah, teach uh, meditation and allow people to have a, a very gentle introduction to it. And that was the start of Calm. And, uh, and then I, I wrote a, a, a book on it um, and released that earlier this year. And we want to develop Calm in, in many, many other ways. So we've been thinking about um, uh, everything from, you know, what about uh, Calm music to uh, help change your mood? Or what about 
calm tea that you could drink? Or what about a range of hotels, calm hotels, where you know you're going to go and have an incredibly restful time? I think it's such an important, powerful uh, emotion. And uh, it passes um, the Google toothbrush test. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but whenever Google are ever evaluating a company um, to acquire or, or whatever, they, they ask themselves, does it pass the toothbrush test? Is it something that people use every single day? And there aren't many products or services that you can say that about. But you know, uh, if you look on your home screen of your phone, many of those apps are things you'll use every day. And there are probably 100 times as many that you've downloaded that you don't even think about. So we wanted Calm to be that. There are so many instances in someone's day where they could find that useful. So as I say, we're thinking all the crazy ways we could expand this. And, and one of the ways I'm most excited about is eventually creating a Calm island. Uh, <laughs> the most relaxing place in the world to, uh, to go and visit. And uh, you're all welcome to come and uh, relax with us on there. Maybe we'll have the odd, the odd party. So, um, so there we go. That's uh, my, uh, my crazy entrepreneurial adventures. There's been lots of other side tracks. Uh, I love investing and uh, kind of um, working with early stage entrepreneurs. Um, I set up a music festival that I loved. I love ping pong and created an event called Ping Pong Fight Club, uh, where startups come and battle it out against each other and all sorts of other uh, crazy things. But as I say, I think there's, there are a few things in life more interesting and exciting than taking the ridiculous, crazy ideas you've got in your head and putting them out in the marketplace and ignoring all those doubters and uh, people that think you're an idiot and proving them wrong. And many of them will fail and, uh, and you'll screw up a lot more times than you succeed. But you only need to crack it once to, to sort of change the world and do something massive. And I think this is such an extraordinary time in history to be uh, building companies, um, you know, developing tech startups. There's disruption. Um, um, causing so much uh, chaos for these big uh, incumbent businesses and industries that have had it their way for such a long time. It's so incredibly exciting. Two billion people are online at the moment. That number is going to double by the end of this decade. And most of them will have a super power, super computer in their pocket. And the ideas, the way of connecting people with um, or connecting people with businesses and building new brands, I think uh, there's so much uh, more to, to go. And I imagine many of you are thinking about ideas, and some of you may have already launched businesses. And uh, so um, good luck to you all. I hope you all get the chance to, to work on or create epic, uh, world-changing ideas. So thank you very much for listening. That's been my story. Cheers. No, I need some Red Bull. An <laughs> interesting and uh, I'm sure you will agree, fascinating, wide ranging, and really honest talk about entrepreneurialism and about his journey. I'm sure we've got lots of questions. I'll start with my own question, which is I was, um, I was really fascinated to hear you talking about mindfulness and learning how to deal with situations by responding rather than reacting. And I thought it might be really interesting to hear you know, how you use that in a business, con um, business context and where maybe there's been a situation in the past you would have reacted to and you found yourself learning to respond to. Yes, so um, there's a lot of uh, kind of stereotypes of, of business, particularly big moguls who are incredibly um, uh, passionate, but also that passion spills over into anger. You know, we've heard many stories of uh, people, th everything from throwing chairs around the room to firing subordinates in lifts. And, and uh, I don't think there are many instances where losing one's temper and cool in a, a business setting makes sense. I'm all for passion, but I think once you start raising your voice and, and getting angry and, and becoming rude to people you work with, I think you're halfway or you're well on your way to losing an argument. So being mindful allows you to kind of have that just fraction of a second before you decide to blow up at someone to find is there a smarter way of doing it and dealing with a situation. Um, and you know, may, maybe another example is um, uh, driving on the road. How many people have been in a taxi where the driver gets cut up and he's angry and he shouts and that that sort of negative energy and that stress spills over onto you. And many people will carry that stress that maybe happens in the morning with them all day and infect other people they're with. And instead of 
getting angry with someone that cuts you up, which you, you're not going to do anything about it. You're not going to be able to change it. Just thinking, well, maybe they're in a, a crazy rush. Let them get on with it. Stay calm, take a breath, and just carry on with your day. So, so many, many, so many of these um, examples that I think are valuable. And it's become a real sort of trend at the moment, mindfulness in business. There's been many books written about it, many case studies of, of companies trying it. And uh, as I said earlier, it's not a panacea. It's not a silver bullet that solves everything. But I think it's a really valuable skill for um, anyone. And as I say, so many instances in businesses where it's useful, from strengthening your focus to increasing your resilience to improving your relationships with other people you work with. Hi there. Thanks for a very good uh, talk. Thank you. Um, you talked about uh, I like the uh, I love the imagery of of little kids like starlings just sort of walking off to the next thing. But when you look back at um, like the Barbie doll, uh, which so 25 years old, Monopoly games, there were brands that were able to entertain generation after generation of children. Do you think in the age we're in with digital and um, so many channels of uh, information available to to everybody that it's harder for a brand to have longevity in today's age. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very um, important and great, great question. We spend a lot of time thinking about this. I think you're right. In the kids space, there are some brands that have stood the test of time. Uh, Lego is a great example. Pokemon's almost 20 years old and, and still, still going strong. Um, but there are many, many more examples of things that have burned brightly and then faded away. And I think it's, it, it is true in the grown-up, the adult space, but um, much more so in the kids space. And we have found it. I think it is much harder now to answer your question in the, the mobile era. Attention spans are, are getting shorter, as Wired uh, called it a few years ago. This is the, the snacking generation who, um, the ten the, as I say, attention spans are, are shorter. So um, what we found when we launched many apps uh, with Moshi and our other brands is that kids would sometimes get into them very deeply, but often only for a few days or a week or two at the time. You know, look at Crossy Road or Flappy Bird or many of these things that were huge and then faded away. And what's happening in the App Store, um, particularly in the game space, is the difference between, the gap between the winners and the losers is, um, I've never seen anything in a market so, so uh, great, where companies like King and Supercell are making millions and millions of dollars a day and able to plow back um, that into marketing to. Uh, reinforce their, their position. Hundreds of millions of dollars a year they spend in marketing, but then there are um, hundreds of thousands of other apps that are just not managing to, to break through, or if they do, it's only for a very short space of time. So um, yes, definitely getting harder. I think, uh, and then the final thing I'd say on it is, one of the reasons I love Calm, and one of the things I'd urge anyone building a brand to do, is ask yourself a, a question that Jeff Bezos um, uh, does, is that in 10 years' time, um, he says, will people still want low prices? Yeah. Um, in 10 years' time, do we think people will still want great customer service? Yes. 10 years' time, will people still want their products delivered really quickly? Yes. So therefore, um, we have some strong foundations to build our business and obsess over those elements. And you know, we couldn't have said the same about Moshi. Will kids still be into it in 10 years? With Calm, I think we can. Will people still value this, this emotion in, in 10 years, in 100 years? And I think absolutely. And that's a much stronger way to, to try, I think, and build a business and, and invest. <coughs> Hi, Michael. Thank you very much. Fascinating presentation. Um, so I run a digital detox business. Ah. So, so <laughs> sort of in the, we in the same area of helping people get in touch with themselves. Yeah. And um, I have a marketing dilemma, and I wanted to hear your comment on that. So um, I don't feel very comfortable promoting my business in traditional terms, like spamming people by emails. Because, you know, if you're on digital detox, that's not what you want to do. Um, I guess you're sort of have maybe facing the same thing because if calm is all about like, you know, not give, getting people too much information. So what's your promotion strategy and your marketing strategy? What do you see working and what do you see not working? Thank you. Yeah. So. Um very an another great question. This um, the irony is not lost on me <laughs> that uh, you know we're using uh, the device and technology to uh, try and help people um, because of the problems that the technology has caused in the first place. So what I would say to that is that the phone and, and the technology is not the problem. 
Um, it is the way we use them. It's our relationship with them that's the, the issue. It's the same with, say, you know, electricity. Electricity can be used to cook your dinner or it can be used to, to cook a man on death row. And it's, it's neither good nor bad. Sorry to crazy ex an example, but it's, it's neutral. And I think what happens is we have these devices that we use mindlessly. You know, you see so often people walking down the street lost on the phone. You see couples and restaurants on the phone instead of connecting with each other. You see parents with their kids using it. And I think that, that is the problem when we do it instinctively. It's very similar to um, the reward cycles in the brain uh, with slot machines, where we mindlessly pull that trigger and uh, get that uh, um, you know, uh, variable reward every now and then. And it's the same, um, the, uh, the, is it the, uh, I think it's the, the jolt, the little spritz of um, uh, dopamine that you get when you open up your phone and you discover you've had a, a new mention on Twitter and then you check that and then you go and have a look at WhatsApp and then you have a look at Facebook and then you come back to your email and round and round you go in that loop and what I think mindfulness is so powerful at doing is it helps you stop and break that cycle so you can use these amazing devices in incredibly powerful ways but um, you don't need to do it all the time so I would urge you, if you're building a digital de detox business go go crazy promoting it online don't have any qualms of using the technology in those very powerful channel to reach two billion people but on the event itself you know maybe take the phone off people and and have a different set of rules there um, there's a great company in the US called camp grounded who do this and they take adults away for kind of summer camp and uh, they confiscate their phones and they go and uh, sort of um, have great times they learn archery and they go swimming in lakes and they sort of uh, uh, stargaze at night and they sit around campfires and they create really strong human connections and uh, people come out of it just completely transformed and blown away and uh, but um, but no one I think I certainly wouldn't say that uh, we need to ban these devices completely or, or not use them so for our business so oh yes so to the original question <laughs> sorry rambling on um, so we have found and this is a, another lesson um, I've never developed a business that has had so much organic growth and word of mouth and when you do that that's you know you're onto something special so we've had over three million downloads for, for calm and most of that has just been through word of mouth and I think what often happens is when people launch something uh, and they don't get that early growth they think the solution is just to start marketing I, I hear it so many times people just want to raise money to market their product but I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it I think you should spend all your energy and rare cash uh, into to building an epic product that people want to share and talk about. The marketing is almost like the, the gasoline you pour on the bonfire once you've got those flames uh, roaring. So we've obsessed, we've done very little marketing, we've obsessed on the product, made it as amazing as we can, and then now we're starting to do uh, a little bit more traditional marketing. So Facebook channel has been successful for us. We've done a little bit of Instagram, um, uh, experimenting with AdWords, but I think those will always be support to the core. My question is related to um, Moshi. Uh, in the beginning, it was a slow or at least stable growth, which was in the first year and a half. Yes. But then there was a big increase. Uh, would you say that was any changing factor there? It was your changing something or, or just the users? Yeah, so we, um, we base in the summer of 09, we hit our tipping point, and uh, another great book, I'm sure lots of you have, have read it. Um, and basically what happened was, I think, you know, we tried pretty much everything else. Um, we were exploring so many different features and changing things around, but I'd probably say two things more than anything else led to that, um, that tipping point. One was that we stopped Moshi being a solo experience. It, it used to be very much about just looking after your pet, feeding it, playing puzzles and, and whatever. And we recognize that kids love to be social just as much as grown-ups. And if we could build safe tools for them to um, send safe messages to their friends or uh, birthday greetings or pieces of art, um, that would help the, the network grow. So that was really powerful. And secondly, it was around that time as we just started to take off and we saw there was magic there that we started doing a little bit of um, uh, TV marketing, which um, became... Uh, the key channel for, for Moshi in those early days and we had a marketing director that came on board and said 
in his first week, I want to do some TV advertising for, for Moshi. And I thought he was completely mad. You know, that was the, the old world. We're a digital business. You can't track it. It costs a fortune. And I was blown away by um, how wrong I was. And uh, um, we used, with our TV ads, it was incredibly much cheaper than I thought. And we knew, used unique URLs at the end of every advert so we could track um, uh, which adverts were more successful. And uh, so, yeah, that was, that was what caused it to take off. Hi, timing's great because you asked what went right. <coughs> and um, I always like to understand a little bit about what went wrong and yeah. take away those lessons. And um, I mean, firstly, you've done very, very well. And um, congratulations on that. But um, I just want to ask about what happened with Mike Candy. And obviously, you guys have been caught in a few say, crosswinds, like with the switch over from desktop to mobile. Um, and I think you, got, you guys put your platform on Flash, and obviously that was part of that. Uh, is it that, or is it the increased competition, or is it just the fact that it's really difficult to build a series of hits as a game with games? I mean, we've seen the likes of Rovio and, and King also struggle to reproduce their initial success. So I'm just wondering what, what you felt really hit you the most. Yes, yeah, so God, I could talk about this for hours and hours. I'll try and condense it. In hindsight, is a wonderful thing, but there's a lot of things I'd have done differently. Um, I think my biggest mistake was assuming that uh, just because we were growing like this, we'd continue to grow like that forever. And so we built our cost base assuming that would happen. And uh, we had over 200 people. Um, in 2012, we were doing about $80 million in revenue, $17 million EBITDA. It was like just, you know, we thought we could do no wrong. Uh, and then when things um, switched and kids, uh, so it was a whole combination of single factors. One, I think, was Moshi had had you know, a four or five year run and it was becoming less cool, so some kids were, were starting to, to move off. Secondly was this was the period where we needed to switch to tablet and, and mobile because that's where kids were moving from the web. And we assumed we'd be able to take our great brand and just create an app and everything would be rosy. Um, and we learned the economics of the App Store are extremely extraordinarily different to the economics we had on the web. We had a wonderful subscription business, five pounds a month that contributed 50% of our revenue. The licensing did the other half. But in the App Store, about 97% of revenue comes from in-app purchases. And uh, you can't really do in-app purchase for kids, or you can't do it easily. Um, the companies like King and Supercell, the bulk of their revenue comes from what they call whales, which are their big, big spenders that are spending um, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars a month. You definitely don't have kids that uh, can spend that much, or, nor should you. Um, so that, that was a, a factor that, uh, that, that was um, difficult. Uh, and uh, again, just, there's a, just a lot more choice. The barriers to entry in the web area were very high, building a website like Moshi or Club Penguin or Pop Tropica. In the App Store, kids at a click of a button, they could download hundreds, thousands of, of free apps. And as I said earlier, they bounced around between them all. So there was a whole range of different factors that caused our um, numbers to start coming down very, very quickly. And I think we should have recognized it earlier and um, cut back and changed salary. Uh, trained strategy, but we didn't. And so, yeah, we've had a, a really, really rough few years. We've had to go through um, several rounds of layoffs, so it's been incredibly painful, um, and uh, rethink and, and restructure the business and um, desperately try and spark up amazing new brands. But it's a lot harder said than done. And again, Rovio are going through exactly the same thing on a much larger scale. I think they got up to about 1,000 employees. And uh, the entertainment industry is much, much easier like venture capital, if you can spread your risks across uh, many, many different brands and, and have a big portfolio. Um, so yeah, that's a mini version of a, a, a much longer one. Okay. Being we've got time for two or three more questions, so I'm saying boom, 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 should we go in and out of order? And then there'll be chance for more questions at the uh, reception after. But. So thank you again uh, for a very insightful and I'd, I'd say very genuine talk. Um, so just on the topic of lessons learned, um, Taking all the way back to uh, Perplex City, uh, and just looking at the figures, um, you had 10 million, uh, and it seems nine went into um, Perplex. I can imagine, and I can just imagine that there would have been a lot of, not just financial, um, I guess, or investment, but you would have been quite emotionally invested into uh, Perplex. At what point, and, and, and what was the trigger to say, right, you know what, we need to cut our losses here, and, and, and what made you wake up and say, we, we have to stop uh, and look at a brand new venture, because I can only imagine how hard that would have been having invested so much. 
Yeah, wow, another great question. You guys are sharp. <laughs> this must be a business school. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's one of the toughest things uh, entrepreneurs and startups have to, to make a call on. So, you know, there's two diametrically opposed opinions. One is you just keep going, as Winston Churchill used to say, when you're going through hell, you keep going and you just plow on and on and on until they drag you from the building by your fingernails. Um, and the other is, no, be smart. If, if your vision is not working, if the data is showing it's not working, cut and go on to something else. But there's no... There's no formula in the world that can tell you when to, to, to make that call. You look at as much data as you can, you look at the wider marketplace, you try and assimilate everything you can. But at the end of the day, for me in particular, it just comes down to a, a gut feeling. And I think when Perplex City was really, really struggling, even though, as I said, we were winning awards and the press was telling us how amazing we were, and um, I'd wake up at 4 a.m. every night and just be in a cold sweat going, oh, this is not working, I don't think. But I'd have to go into work with a, a smile on my face and try and G the team up. And I think it was, um, it was months and months of doing that where I said, do you know what, it, we can't do this anymore. Let's stop. Let's, we, we've just as got enough cash for one more idea and let's bet on that. Um, but yeah, many, many other examples in, in business where entrepreneurs have had to make that call and many, many examples where people have made the wrong call and uh, you know, given up something incredible too early or, uh, or the, the reverse. So I think Seth Godin wrote a good book about this a few years ago. I think it's called The Dip. Um, and uh, it's similar also to that, that graph that Y Combinator often show, the, uh, the trough of illusion, illusionment disillusionment, where a new venture, everything is rosy, everyone's got such energy, you're going to take on the world, and suddenly you realize it's a lot harder than you think, and you just spend months in this period where, oh, bloody hell, it's one foot in front of the other, and if you've got a strong vision and you are slightly deranged and you think there's something there, you just, just keep going. Hi, Michael. My name's Ray Hunt. Hello. Um, so, what are you going to do differently now with my Candy? Yeah. <laughs> Good, uh, good, good question. <laughs> Let me think about this. Um, so, not get so carried away um, with uh, with costs, and be very, very careful. Even when things start doing taking away, uh, taking off, just being a bit more careful. Um, uh, if someone comes knocking on our door, waving a huge check, being a little more humble and willing to listen. <laughs> Um, because we had many opportunities to, you know, sell during the, the go-go days. Um, but we wanted to change the world. We wanted to build something extraordinary. We wanted to create this, the next Disney. So we did want to keep, keep plowing onwards. Um, I think that the final thing I'd say is rather than putting all eggs in one basket and betting on, on one thing, I think it's smarter to try and uh, spread uh, bets a little better. Small teams with very tight timelines um, trying to come up with, with magic and launching things, you know, the minimal viable product and all that. Uh, there's a company in um, uh, South Korea, or I think it's uh, Kakao, who came up with Kakao Chat, and that was from one of their little prototype teams. Four people, four months, what can you create? And uh, that's a smarter way, I think, of finding um, great stuff rather than just as I said, what we did with our second project after Moshi, which was spend millions of dollars, several years, uh, trying to create something amazing and, and realizing that uh, the market didn't quite agree. Hi, Michael. Uh, Hello. John, co-founder of Pobble. So ah. given the number of uh, entrepreneurs in the room, uh, how do you think about investments? Like, what are the things that you're looking for, or is there a particular channel to kind of come to you with uh, investment ideas? Yeah, so I, I love um, investing in, in new ideas. I've, I've cut it back a, a little bit just because I'm juggling so many other things at the moment. But um, what I look for is um, uh, an idea that I, I get and understand and uh, think I can add value with. I really love um, uh, business to consumer businesses, um, brand businesses, um, not so sharp on the uh, software as a service space. Um, and I think at the end of the day, a lot of investors say this, it really just comes down to the chemistry with the, 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 the founder. And can you look them in the eye and do you think they've got what it takes to uh, uh, build their vision and be able to change it if they need to be? So it's a bit of a cliche, but it's always better to invest in, in a, an A person with a B idea than a, um, a B person with an A idea because most startups, most successful companies have 
uh, tweaked and pivoted to various degrees along, along the way. And it uh, all comes down to that, uh, that founder or that founding team to, to do that. Well, I think we've got a minute left, so I've got okay. one, one more question, if that's okay, which is, as this is London Business School, but it's obviously a incredibly international community we have here, I'd love just to hear your thoughts on London as a centre for, for startups and for tech, because I know that's something you're incredibly keyed into. Yeah, I, I love London. I've lived here most of my life. I think it's uh, one of the, the greatest cities on earth, particularly on a sunny day, uh, which we're, uh, especially on a sunny we don't get too many of those. But I think there's something, something magic about London which you don't get um, in other uh, tech clusters. It's just this really cosmopolitan, interesting mix of not just different uh, types of people from all around the world, but different industries. You know, we've got the, the finance hub, we've got uh, fashion, we've got creativity, we've got music, we've got, you know, so many of these things coming together. And I think that's why we're starting to see some really unusual businesses come out of London that might not um, have been uh, sparked to life elsewhere. I mean, Silicon Valley is an extraordinary and amazing place as well. And I, I definitely want, I spend a little bit of time there and, um, you know, in the future, uh, would love to spend uh, more time. But um, that's, uh, that they're very focused on the, the tech and have an incredible ecosystem that's built up over, over decades. But um, yeah, London, I think, has a, a real magic special charm. Can we all give him a big round of applause? Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Love it. Cheers.